Uh, I didn't tell you this, Jana, but maybe you can. I don't know if you can go back and change it, but I'm calling this the Lord of Hosts. And everywhere I go, every song I sit here, everything, scriptures that are read right now, everything is the Lord of Hosts right behind her back there, King of Glory, Lord of Hosts, banner that is over this place. And it is a banner that's over this place, the Lord of Hosts. And so the Lord of Hosts, hosts means angel armies, or it can mean armies on earth. And how many of you know that angels are messengers of God? So we can be angels. That doesn't mean we're always all so sweet and we always do everything right. It just means we're messengers of God. We bring messages of God. Angels can come and bring messengers of God from heaven, or messages from God from heaven. Um, and so the Lord of hosts means he's the Lord over the angel armies, okay? And how many of you know we've been learning a lot about the dichotomy of God? And when we hear armies, we think certain things in our head. There's a lot of um, military language that's used in the Bible because God wants us to understand, but our weapons of warfare are different than worldly weapons of warfare. And that doesn't just mean, I heard um, somebody minister a long time ago really stuck with me, you know, we think um, when you say they're not the same as the worldly weapons, we think maybe knives or guns or things like that, or we may even think like anger, things like that. But it goes a whole lot deeper than that. The weapons of, the, of this world are like, uh, I'm going to intimidate you. I'm going to manipulate you. I'm going, and people do that in a lot of different ways. They can be mad. They can cry. They can, they can use money. Well, yeah, and right now, isn't that very prevalent, you know, how money manipulates and bribes people? Um, you can play on people's heartstrings. You know, husbands and wives sometimes have a really hard time with this because they know what buttons to push with their spouse that's going to, you know, really hurt them. That's why it's so hard for people to trust each other because when you get really close and start sharing things with people, they can turn around and use that against you when they're mad at you. And and we can we do that sometimes, and we, you don't even realize it because we grew up with those weapons, right? We grew up in that system where we're always trying to get what we want for ourselves. We were told, I was in my generation, told, you know, if it doesn't make you happy, don't do it. If the person that you're with doesn't make you happy, go find somebody that does. Do whatever you do, want to do as long as you don't hurt anybody. Well, you know, I had a conversation with my mom a while back, and she made a statement like that, and I said, let me ask you something. When I was a teenager and did what I wanted to do, did that hurt you? And she said, yes. And I said, then it's impossible, right? It's impossible for us to just constantly go around and do what we selfishly want to do and not hurt the people around us. And so we grew up with these weapons. We didn't even realize it, but everybody around us uses these weapons so much that it just becomes a part of who we are. The weapons of his warfare are not the same as that. And we're going to read that scripture, of course, because I'm quoting it. But, um, you know, we had a big revelation drop in on us last week of that peace, being at peace as being at war with the enemy. And it's like that is one of those things that is so opposite of what we've been taught in the world. And I have come, I've been in three conversations since that revelation we got last week. And it's like, to let to to give people this is what God told me you can he let's see this is what God told me he can give people permission to let go of that worry and so he had me telling people you have permission to let go of that it is really really hard because we that's one of our weapons worrying about our children worrying about our spouse, worrying about our money, worrying about all these different things that go on in our lives. You know, and, and I was thinking how many different things that peace is the opposite of. You know, peace is the opposite of worry. Peace is the opposite of anger. Peace is the opposite of being crazy and going off the deep end, you know. So it's like peace is such a major weapon, like I just can't even tell you everything that has went through my mind in the last week. If you can stay at peace, and we've talked about this before, and I I believe it to be true, 
you know, what do you think terrorists are trying to do? They're trying to put fear in you. Peace is the opposite of fear. I don't think I said that. They're trying to put fear in you, right? If you can stay at peace in that, I'm wondering if they would have no power over you whatsoever. And we've all heard stories like that of missionaries and different people who, you know, came up against armies of evil and they were able to stay at peace. And I'm, I have the one story I tell all the time. They, tried to sh- they were trying to shoot her and she just closed her eyes. I don't even think she was trying to be in peace. I just think she was so close to God at the time that that's what he had her do. She closed her eyes and she just started singing to him. And when she tells the story, it doesn't sound like she was very worried about it. And she said, I closed my eyes, I started singing, and I thought, well, Jesus, I guess I'm about ready to meet you face to face. I I wonder what this is going to feel like. I hope it doesn't hurt. And she's just saying it calmly like that. And she's like that for a while, and all of a sudden, like, nothing's happening. She opens her eyes, he's trying to shoot her, and his gun is jammed. So, and she came into several, she had several things like that happen. And then she had a time when God said, don't go out. Okay, so listening to his voice is very, very important in all of this. You know, um, peace may not look like we define peaceful sometimes. We may be declaring things loudly. We may be jumping up and down. We may be flailing our arms. God may, you know, God had, has us do all kinds of things in here, you know, like different things that represent something in the spirit we don't always necessarily know. So it may not look like peace to us. But it's the peace in here. It's the peace in here of knowing I've heard his voice and I'm doing what he's telling me to do. And that because I've heard his voice and obeyed it, the outcome is going to be what he has called it to be. And so that's the peace we're looking for. And, we're, and sometimes it may look like quiet. You don't say a word. You know, when somebody thinks you should be yelling, scared, whatever. Or sometimes it may be jumping up and down, flailing your arms, doing whatever. So you may be saying strong words to somebody. You may even look like you're mad sometimes because you may be going after some devils or something, you know. But the peace, is, it comes from in here of knowing that you've heard his voice and you're doing what he's asked you to do. So it is big time warfare. And, and, and as the revelation came about, it was when we're warring in our minds trying to be peaceful, that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. That's better than just going along with the devil, whatever he's telling you to do, right? But when you're warring in your mind, you're not yet warring against him. You're still warring against yourself. You're trying to get yourself in that place of where God's kingdom is at so that you can be a war, at war against him. I, just, I can't even tell you the amazingness of this revelation that I think that this is going to change our lives if we can learn how to walk in it. If we can really learn how to walk it in, and I had some little things this week, you know, sometimes when I felt like the enemy was trying to make me, you know, worried about something small, it wasn't a big thing, and, you know, even those little things sometimes are hard, like, okay, God is my provider, God is my provider, you know, that's where my peace is at. He may use my job, or he may use other things to provide for me, but he's my provider, no worry, you know, and this is really hard for us, like, especially when it comes to your kids, your husband, something to do with health issues, things like that, um, because we think if we don't worry that we're not being good parents, we're not being a good wife, we're not being a good steward of the God, things that God's given us to do, right? And I, and I prayed for one person this week, took a hold of her hands and prayed for her, and she put her head down, closed her eyes, and and shook her head as I'm praying. I'm praying this over her peace. And I give you permission to let this go. Let this person go. Give them to God. Let him take control of them. He'll tell you when he wants you to do something. But you, you need to be in peace. And, and, you know, shaking her head and agreeing. And then the minute the prayer was done, opened her eyes and said, well, yeah, and that's how my week went the last two weeks, you know. So, it, you know, going back to what all the whole story that she had told me before that. So it's like, you know, it's not always going to be received because it's a hard thing to do. We have been so ingrained with the idea that we have to worry. We have to, you know, we're not responsible if we don't worry. And we're not responsible if we don't take action and do something. You know, they're going to go down the drain, okay? I heard somebody say this week, you can, you're in control of what you say and what you do. You, are, you cannot be in control of how people respond to what you say and what you do. So you're... You know, you're not going to be able probably to change that person unless God gives you specific words to say to them. You say what you feel like God's saying. 
and then you let it go and you release them to him. He may have you do more with it, he may not. But the point I'm trying to get at, the worry does you no good. The worry does them no good. The worry does, n- and it, it's the kingdom of the enemy. It is. When we get in that worrying stuff, it's in the kingdom of the enemy. So we need to stay out of that and learn that, and I'm going to say this over you, I'm going to say this over anybody listening on the internet, God is giving you permission to let go of the worry. God is giving you permission to let go of the fear. God is giving you permission to take on his peace and be peaceful even though the situation around you seems like it's out of control. And then you go to him in that peaceful place and you say, okay, what do you want me to do in this? And you hear his voice, okay? So I think I'm going to start, um, I just have a couple scriptures, three maybe, four, ten, I don't know, we'll see. Um, I think I'll start with Ephesians 6, which, um, you know, Terry read to us a week ago Wednesday and then, or Wednesday and then Sunday, I don't know if you read it last Wednesday. Anyway, you read it Wednesday and Sunday, and then we went to pray at the school, and they read the same scripture. And then one day I was listening to somebody else, and they were reading the scripture. So it's like, okay, God, you know, what do you really want to say to us in that? And um, a week ago Wednesday when we were doing that, you know, God was telling us you have to wear your own armor. So we're, what we're going to read is you need to put on the whole armor of God, right? And we're going to kind of go through it and maybe go into a little more depth of what each of those things are and what they mean and how they look in everyday life. Um, but God said to us that night, that, you know, and, and, we, and I prayed as we were praying and we, we agreed together and we were singing Lord Sabaoth, Lord of hosts, we will follow you to war. Okay, that, this is the war that we're talking about. We got that on Wednesday night, and then Sunday he gives us the revelation that being at peace is at war. And oh, by the way, during the week I listened to somebody else, and they were on the same thread talking about war being this and that, and they said waiting on God is war. When you wait on God, and I talking to Sharon, I thought that was so good what you said the other day, Sharon, is like, we all say, you are my Lord, you're my God, I'll do whatever you say, I'll do whatever you want, I'll wait on you until I hear a word from you, and then we go to the doctor and do what the doctor says, and then we go to the therapist and we do what the therapist says, or we go get a job and get our own money and do what our, you know, spend our money where, where um, we feel like we should spend our money or do, you know, whatever it is, Okay. I'm not saying you can't go to the doctor. I'm not saying you can't go to a therapist. I'm not saying you can't spend money to get out of a problem. What I'm saying is, is we tell him all the time that he's our God and that he's our Lord, right? He's, our, he's the Lord of hosts. He's the one that leads this battle. But then we don't wait on him to hear what he says to do. And we have to hear. And like, seriously, I know people think I'm against going to doctors and stuff. I'm not. I'm not against that. I'm only against that if you're doing it out of fear or because that's what the world says you're supposed to do or that's what you've always done. I'm against it when you don't hear from him first. Like, what is he saying to do? And if you don't have faith for that, by all means, go to the doctor. But we have to start, we have to start ministering things and preaching things above and beyond what we're living. And the, like he was talking last week, the experiences that we have, they're too low. Terry is singing about how big God was this morning. Oh, my Lord. Like, he felt so big to me when you were singing that. Like, he is so big. Do we not think he can't take care of these little things in our bodies, these little problems that we have with each other? Everything, when she was singing that this morning, everything in my life that I worry about and I'm so concerned about seemed so small compared to how big he is. Why can we not trust him? We go around declaring all the time he's our Lord, but then we don't trust him to wait on him long enough to give the answer. And what happens a lot of times is we miss the really good things that God has for us because we do things too soon. You know, people who said God doesn't heal, you know, I've never seen him heal, I've never seen a miracle. Well, did you wait? Did you wait on him? You know, he's never provided money for me. Did you wait on him? Did you wait and do what he said? Did you do what he asked you to do? Or did you run out in fear and do whatever you want. And I'm not saying I have this by any means, 
But I'm saying if we don't minister this stuff and start grabbing a hold of it and believing it, that it's true, and then having God teach us how to walk it out, we'll never get there. If I sat here and I just preach these levels that we're walking at to you, how, what will we ever go for bigger than that? You know, if Mike hadn't preached all these things to us for all these years that, you know, God showed me one time, bring you the tenth of your income to the storehouses, and that is tithe, but it's a lot of other things too. Okay, bring the tenth of your tithe to the storehouses, and uh, I will rebuke the devourer, and I will hear for heaven and see if I will not pour out a blessing on you that you cannot contain. And everybody thinks, oh, that's money, money, money. I'm going to take a tenth of my income, and God's going to bless me with money. No, what God showed me is the things we've learned here, the revelations that have come here, the things that he's ministered that are so far above and beyond what we live every day, those are windows of heaven. He, God showed me at the time he was a window of heaven being opened that was pouring a blessing out on me that I could not contain because I, can't, I still can't walk in it. In fact, the more you walk with God, the more you feel like you're walking in. The bigger you see that he is, the bigger you see what this whole thing is and where we're going, the smaller and smaller and smaller and further away from it that you feel. And yet, like, like Mike always says, isn't it so amazing how that doesn't make you feel bad, but it makes you feel good. Like the more you see him, the smaller you feel, the less you think you know, the better you feel. Like, and maybe it's because we quit trying to fix it all ourselves, you know? And we, we start walking in that place where he's so big and we yield to him and we're starting to wait on him in some areas and good things are happening. So it gets better and better all the time. You got something? I just have to say this, sorry. Um, when you see that, when you begin to experience that, you're actually glorying in your weaknesses. Glorying in your weaknesses. Yeah, like Paul did. Yeah. You know, that's a great statement, great scripture, but how many people actually live it? Right. See, when you see yourself getting smaller and feeling good, you're glorying in right. your weaknesses. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Okay, so it's Ephesians 6.11. I'm going to read out of the Passion Translation. I'm, I'm going to do all but one scripture out of the Passion Translation because it says it's so different. And all I think I have four scriptures, and all of them are scriptures that we all know so well. We've quoted them so many times. We've read them so many times. People use them all the time for whatever purposes. And it's like, so I'm going to read them out of the Passion Translation so they sound a little different. Maybe they'll kick, our, kick us into a little different way of thinking, right? Uh, let's see, I've got to bring it up on here. You guys are probably there and I'm not. Oh, yes, I am. Aha. Okay, so I guess I'm going to start in verse 10 on this one. This is called the armor of God in this Bible. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. And isn't that what everybody wants to do? Let's, like, that's the plan, right? Let's take a stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Okay, so right there, that does away with all the politics. Let's get rid of them. They're not going to work, right? Because that's all a struggle against flesh and blood. But against rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So there's the number one thing right there we got to get down to begin with, okay? And don't think of this as... I'm looking at you, and I'm saying, I'm coming against those, fear, those evil spiritual forces that are in you, right? No. What about those evil spiritual forces that are in me? What about those things in me that are not listening to God, those things in me that are resisting what he says? That's where our battle is. And I was thinking about the scripture that says, take the speck out of your own eye, then you can take the plank out of your brother's eye. And, you know, I, even that we kind of see it like, oh, well, I can't minister to you about this until I get this out of my eye. But when I can learn how to battle the, the evil forces in my life, now I'm, I'm taking that speck out of my eye. I'm way more equipped to help you battle those forces in your life. And God wants us to help each other battle our forces, but it can't be, oh, I've got it all and I'm going to come after yours. You learn how to battle those forces in yourself first. And isn't it funny how once you've battled something and you've got some victory over it, you kind of can see when it's, when it's taking somebody else down. You know, those things have characteristics. I'm telling you, demonic spirits have characteristics, and you can see those on people. 
and they it's it's like funny like strange to me that they can be so so um easy to see and yet people can't see them you know and like god's told me a long time ago if you don't have the spirit of god in you which is the spirit of wisdom you'll never see it you can talk till you're blue in the face to people unless god tells you to say something but without the spirit of wisdom think of your own self like before we had the spirit of wisdom in us didn't we try to get free of some things and we just couldn't and we kept doing the same dumb things over and over and over thinking we were going to get a different result but without the spirit of wisdom we couldn't really see what was going on so don't be too hard on people that don't get it when you try to minister to them and they keep doing the same thing over and over we got to be praying for those people they get filled with that spirit of wisdom so they can actually see what's going on so the spirits of darkness that we're fighting against are in us first. Therefore, uh, verse 13, therefore put on the full armor of God. So when the day of the evil comes, doesn't say if it comes, it says when it comes. So that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Okay, this is not truth like I saw this happen and it's truth. It's not truth like I went to the doctor and he gave me an uh, x-ray and it had this bad thing on it. It's not truth like my son or daughter is going out and doing this all the time so their lives are going to be a mess, okay? Those things are real and they're happening. And you don't want to say, oh, I don't have anything wrong with me if there's sickness in your body, okay? But truth is the truth that he speaks, Okay, it is reading this word, but it's hearing his voice. It's the truth of what did he say to you. So you get like a bad report from the doctor, but God comes to you and says, no, if you will do this, this will not become anything. Like, you know, you said, you'll seek and search and search and you'll never find that thing that's warring against you. Okay, when God speaks something to you, you hang on that. That's the truth that we're looking for, the truth that he speaks to us, the truth that we know of him, that he, he's never going to put sickness on you. He's never going to kill you. He's never going to kill anybody, any of your family. He, he's not going to do evil things. God doesn't live by the worldly system. So all of those things that I said a little bit ago that we do to manipulate and get our way, he doesn't live by that system. He's not going to do that to you. He's not going to manipulate you to try to get you to do something. He's not going to, uh, you know, cry and say, oh, please, please do this and, and make you feel sorry for him and do that. He's going to tell you the truth of the matter. Sometimes the truth of the matter is hard to take. Sometimes it's hard to swallow. Sometimes when he speaks truth to us, we see things in us that do not look pretty, and he's wanting to get rid of those things. But that's the truth. That's the um, belt that we're going to put on is that belt of truth. It's always what is he saying? What is his truth? Not, and again, I'm not saying, you know, if they give you a diagnosis and it's a bad diagnosis that you're going to say, oh, that's not real. I'm not even going to look at that. That's not real. Okay, that's not what I'm saying. That thing is real, but it's real in this worldly realm that we're living in. The, and, and don't also don't just read this word, say, by his stripes, I am healed. And you just go around and confess that and think that's your truth. That is a true statement. Okay, it is a true statement, okay? But that may not be the truth he's speaking to you at this moment. The truth he's speaking to you at this moment may be stop eating this thing or stop doing that, get rid of this anger that you have, get rid of that. Whatever that truth is that he's speaking to you in that moment, that's the truth that we have to be... And in every situation, like, it, it seems overwhelming sometimes because <laughs> we have so much stuff going on in this world. But we have to put that truth belt of truth on first. Yeah? Give her the microphone. That's where God has been speaking to me this week. Like I was telling you, you know, where we will prefer him. So we might get, you know, we might go to the doctor. We might get what the man has to say, the doctor has to say or whatever. But then you come back and you say, but God, I prefer to hear what you have to say. I want to notice what you have to say. And a lot of us still take that man's voice and hear it. And then the fear comes in right. 
instead of taking it to God and saying, I prefer to hear what you have to say because your word is faithful and true and just. Yes. And righteous. Uh, and all these other things. I remember years ago, Kim Clement used to say, there's a difference between the facts and truth. Yes. That's exactly what you're saying. Yes. Yes. Okay, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place. And I think God is so cool that it's the breastplate because, okay, righteousness, you know, there, we're, there's still a lot out there we're trying to figure out about what righteousness really means and what's the definition of righteousness. I think it's doing it God, God's right way, but it's also being in right standing with him. And so that breastplate is on your heart. So it's that thing of your heart where you know that he's made a way for you to be in right standing with him. In other words, you can come before him, and you were praying this morning about um, condemnation and shame and all those things. That breastplate is on our hearts, that righteousness that I'm in the right place with you, God. Even if I do something wrong today, I'm still in that right place with you. And like you were saying, that song we were singing, I bear my heart to the seeing eyes, right? Okay, so I messed up today. I did something wrong. That doesn't, God isn't going to kick you out of right standing with him because you did that. But he wants you to come to him when you realize it and you say, okay, I bear my heart before you. I still see this thing in here that I have. But we have to know our hearts have to be covered with the righteousness of knowing that we're in right standing with him. Not meaning that we do everything right, but that we are in a place where we have relationship with him and that our hearts are covered with that righteousness and that we're continuing all the time to get to a place where we do do it his right way every time, right? And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes with the gospel of peace. And isn't that what we've been talking about is... Um, Okay, so I'm going to finish that and I'll go back. So the, um, that's your walk. That's, in your, that's on your feet. That's your walk. That's how your walk, you know, we always call it the walk or the walk that we have with God, right? We need that walk to be in peace, and that's what he's been trying to teach us. When we're in peace, that's an act of war. Um, and, and the NIV says your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. So in other words, when you're in peace, you're ready for anything. What seriously, if you if think put wrap your mind around this. If we could stay in peace, what could the enemy throw at us? Because what is he trying to do? He's always trying to get you to go off the deep end and not do what God's saying. And he does that by getting you out of peace. So if we are walking our feet shotted with the gospel of peace, then he can't throw anything at us that we're not ready for, right? That's a cool thought, right? So then I wanted to go back up because this one said righteousness. Um, oh, I'm in the wrong one. That's why. Yes, I am. You should have told me that. <laughs> Okay. Now I'm in the Passion Translation. Um, I'm going to read 14 again. Put on truth as a belt to strengthen you to stand in triumph. Put on holiness as the protective armor that covers your heart. And holiness also is something that's really misunderstood. Holiness just means set apart for something. You know, and I've heard people teach it. You know, it's like a king's spoon. It's only the king can use it. It's set apart for his use to eat his cereal if in the morning. I've heard somebody teach that, okay? But nobody else can touch it. It's only for the king. So when he says he's holy, he's saying, I am set apart only for you. Like, he doesn't go out and, and do things the enemy's way. He doesn't go out and, and do things behind your back. He doesn't betray you. He is set apart with his eyes on you. You know, God doesn't get caught up in all the things we get caught up in. He doesn't have other lovers. He loves his people, you know. He's set apart for us, and he's asking us 
to be set apart for him. And the way I always see that is just what I was saying to you a little bit ago. If I have God set apart and I put him higher than absolutely every other God in my life, then I'm going to wait for him to speak to me first in anything I do. That's what I think holiness is. Holiness is when I set him completely apart. Okay, so go back to the, the example. We go to the doctor. We get, uh, so you get an x-ray and they say, oh, it's this and this and this. You need to go to a specialist. You go to the specialist and they say, oh, it's this and this and this. And you need to do this. And we'll set you up for this surgery this day. So you go to your family and you say, oh, no, I got this bad report. And they say, oh, this and this and this. You need to do this and this and this. And then you go to your pastors and you say, oh, I need to do this and this and this. And they say you need to do this and this and this. And they pray for you. And then you start searching on Google and you find out, oh, this and this and this. Oh, and when somebody else had this, it was this. You know, okay, those are all gods. Every one of those are gods, right? Okay, take your pastors pretty seriously. But, you know, you still have to hear God in what they're saying, Right? You know, everybody's not walking this 100% yet. We have to hear God in what he's saying. So I'm going to listen to my pastors. But what I'm saying is, you have set God apart. If you you go to your pastors, and I've gone to my pastors sometimes where the two of them don't say the same thing. So then it's like, okay, God, I got to know which one of them is saying the right thing. Okay, so you go to to God and and you put him higher than, okay? He's set apart. What he says goes. And he says... And I'm not saying pull something out of Scripture and do it because that's what you want to do and your pastor told you something else. I'm not giving you permission to do that. But I'm saying you know when God drops something in you and that you know that you know that you know that you know that it's him, right? Okay, so that's when you say, I set, you are holy to me. I set you high above what that x-ray said, what that doctor said, what my family said, what Google said. I set you high above what my friends say. I set you high above how my body feels. I set you, you are holy to me, and I set you apart from all of the rest of that, and what you say, say goes, okay? And he says, you know, you do this and you're healed, and you do that, and like it does, you don't think it works, or you stepped out and you did something, you know, you, you took what God said and you twisted it a little bit because you didn't quite understand how he said it or whatever, but you know that he said you're healed, you hang on to that. And I'm just using that as an example because that's a big one that everybody, people always deal with, right? It can be anything. It can be anything. We don't go by what we see with our eyes. We go by what he says, okay? And this is what I heard when we were worshiping this morning and God had me praying this over and over out of my mouth. We inquire of him, And we require him as necessity. So in other words, I'm not just going to go to the doctor and take his word for it. I'm not just going to be flippant about things. I'm going to say, God, I inquire of you, believing that you're going to answer me. And I require you. I require to hear you, to know you, to understand you as necessity. Not, oh, well, I'll pray, and if God doesn't answer me, I'll go to the doctor. I'll, oh, I'll pray, and if God doesn't answer me, I'll go run out and do this, or whatever it is, you know. I'll go do this and get some money so I can pay that bill. I'll go do whatever, whatever. I'll, try, I'll just try to keep my mouth shut and not get angry, you know. Like, these are all things we have to hear from him to get answers for. And we have to require it as necessity. In other words... God, I will not stop until I hear you. I will not stop until I know that I know that what you're saying in this situation, okay? And those are scary prayers to say because what if you're coming down to the deadline of whatever it is and you haven't heard him yet? You've got to trust him. You've got to trust him that he's going to answer us And he told me, I know that I was praying what he was wanting this morning. Inquire of me and require me as a necessity. That's that's what I was praying and that's what he was saying, okay? All right. Now that I'm in the right version, go to verse 16. And in every battle, take faith as your wraparound shield, for it is able to extinguish the blazing arrows coming at you from the evil one. And Again, you know, God is the same. Every one of these are kind of coming out the same, right? 
Holiness is you set him apart. You take his word above everybody else. Faith is hearing him speak. Faith, you get faith by hearing him speak. You don't get faith by working it up and saying, taking a scripture and quoting it over and over, and I'm going to get this to change my mind. Faith is you hear him speak, and, and it is so real that it's him that no matter what happens in front of you. Okay, what does it say? It says, in every battle, take faith as your wraparound shield, for it is able to extinguish the blazing arrows coming at you from the evil one. So when you have faith, you've heard God speak, no matter what the enemy says to you, does to you, if you have real faith that you heard God speak and you're standing on that, you say, God, I know you said this, and no matter what, I'm, this is what I'm going to do. When those arrows come, that faith is a shield, and they just fall off of you. And, you know, it's hard. This church has had to stand like that a lot of times. There's things that God has spoken to this church that we know, that we believe, that we understand, that go completely against the norm of Christianity, but we know that we know that God spoke it. And so it's like when those arrows come, people get mad, people betray, people try to to tear you down, they, you know, all, if they say things about you in the community, all that kind of stuff. And you know, every person that takes a stand with God has that kind of stuff happening to them. But when you are so sure that it's him and you know it's him and where you're going, the direction he's taking you in, the arrows just bounce off. No, nobody likes it. I mean, even probably when you're in armor and, a, and arrows are coming at you, you're probably not going to say, oh, lovely, you know, <laughs> you know, you're, but they bounce off, and you just keep going, right? Embrace the power of salvation's full deliverance like a helmet to protect your thoughts from lies. Okay, and we know we even define salvation a little different, you know, as, than most. It's like salvation for now, for this life, while we're here. Salvation is not to die and go to heaven. Salvation is here. It is peace. It is soul peace. There's that peace word again. It is rescue. It is prosperity. It is provision. What else? Tell me all the things. Deliverance. What? Safety. Rescue. I said that. All those things. The, the amazing things that God is. Okay? When you really know that that's God's salvation and that he's going to give that to you, even when those things that said put that on as a helmet to, keep, to protect your thoughts from lies, so, you know, when you know that God is your peace and those things come at you that try to make you worry or angry or in fear or whatever, you have that helmet on salvation of knowing what his salvation really is. And you put that thing on and it keeps, again, it keeps those arrows from going in. It keeps those, those lies and those thoughts the enemy tries to give you, it keeps them from going in because you've got his salvation knowing that he has real salvation for you. Full deliverance, it says. And my favorite one, take the mighty razor sharp spirit sword of the spoken word of God. That You know, in Hebrews 4.12, I think it is, it says it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It divides. You know, it, it talks about a lot of different things that it divides. Those are things that are very close together and hard to tell the difference in. And when you have that spoken word of God coming out of your mouth, when you have that sword, it, it will. There are, things, there are things in religion that sound really good, and they sound really right. There are things, like Mike was teaching last week, people will take from their experiences. You know, say somebody died, and out of that, uh, a family member came to know God. So to say, oh, well, God will do that so that, you know, so we can have salvation like, that may sound really good because maybe that person was going the wrong direction. But the sword of the Spirit will come in and say, no, God doesn't do that. And I always think, like, okay, so say I'm the one saying, oh, you know, my so-and-so family died and they did this, this salvation message at the, church, at the service and I got saved and my whole life changed. So God did that for me. So God cared less about that person that died than he did me, that he would kill them and save me. Like, that's pretty selfish, isn't it? When people say that, I always think, that's pretty selfish. I don't think God would kill them to save you. God would like to save both of you, right? Okay, we're just about done with this one. Where are we going? 
Pray passionately in the Spirit as you constantly intercede with every form of prayer at all times. And, you know, we have a tendency to stop at 18 with that spirit sword, but that is, you tell me that's not a weapon right there, to pray all the time in every situation in all forms of prayer. Well, what does that mean? Again, that might be loud, boastful, jumping up and down, screaming prayer. That might be prayer from your heart and you're not even opening your mouth. That might be singing in the spirit. It might be praying in tongues. It might be just a thought in your head. Oh my gosh, God, why is this happening this way? It, you know, prayer can come in a lot of different forms, but we're to be, and prayer, all prayer is, is talking to God. All prayers is interacting with him and, and doing all these things we're saying to hear his view on stuff, right? So that's one of the weapons right there too, probably the biggest, most important one. And pray also that God's revelation would be released through me every time I preach. And I was thinking, I'm going to say that at us. God, we pray that your revelation would be released through every one of us every time we preach the wonderful mystery of the hope-filled gospel. That God, even as we're in our day-to-day things, that is preaching, that is ministering. When we're talking to people about who you are, God, that's preaching and ministering. And I just pray, God, that your revelation would be released through each and every one of us as we minister to people during our days. And yes, God, I pray that we preach the wonderful nude of your kingdom with, with bold freedom at every opportunity. And even though we are chained as prisoners, that we are your ambassador. And God, we think chained as your prisoners means we still have bondages on us. We may not be in physical prisons, but we still, there are still bondages and things on us that he's wanting us to get free from. But God, we say, even though we still have these things, let us be your mouthpiece. Let us be an ambassador for you. Let us show forth who you are and what your character is. <sighs> Isn't that good? Okay. So then I'm just going to read this one to you. You don't have to go there. Romans 16. Well, maybe I do because I don't know if I have the whole thing wrote down. And this is one we've been quoting a lot here the last few weeks. And Terry was even singing the song that we knew years ago the other day. Sixteen nineteen. I am so happy when I think of you because everyone knows the testimony of your deep commitment of faith. So I want you to become scholars of all that is good and beautiful and stay pure and innocent when it comes to evil. Oh my gosh. Like if we, th- that's a deep, there's deep stuff in there. That, that needs to be dug out. What is innocence, you know? I felt like God's been speaking to me a lot lately. My life, you know, if you looked at it from the, the worldly American standpoint, Like, I haven't been very innocent. You know, I've done a lot of things that don't seem very innocent. But when I hear some of the stories that come from Africa and Afghanistan and these places and the things that these people have seen that I've never had to experience, I've never, like, I'm not going to say I've never been scared of something in my life, but I've been pretty much safe my entire life. I've been pretty much, could walk out my back door at midnight and not worried that anybody's going to hurt me or harm me and that. Like, I feel pretty innocent in things, okay? Jesus experienced a ton of stuff, okay? Like, his death, we always just think of him hanging on the cross and how terrible that was, but every evil work was there. And his whole entire life, every evil work was constantly trying to get him to turn, right? Get him turn away from God and do what the enemy wanted him to do. And he, they saw horrendous things. In those days, they crucified people, you, when you're walking up and down the street, you know, there's crucified people there to say, if you don't do what we say, this is what's going to happen to you. You know, there was a lot of terrible things. And then when he's hanging on the cross, you know every devil from hell was there, right? Trying to, at the very last moment, you know, get, even talking through the, the guys hanging beside him. You know, if you're the son of God, come down. That's an evil work. That was an evil work trying to get him to stop what God had called him to do, Right? Okay, and so he stayed innocent through all of that. He stayed innocent through all of that. He didn't turn bitter. He didn't get angry. He, didn't, he said, God, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He stayed pure to the Father. He stayed innocent from all of that. And it's like, 
We have to learn how to do that. We don't know what we might see in the coming days. Or we know, we have people that we know that are already living through some of this stuff. We know that there's underground churches in other countries that are living through all of this stuff right now as we speak, right? And so I pray for their heart to be innocent, that they could have the love of God in them. Whatever that love of God tells them to do, whether he tells them to run He tells them to hide. He tells them to go out and be bold and speak to the people that are doing the evil, awful things because they're going to turn. But whatever it is, God, that their hearts would stay innocent to you, pure from that evil. In other words, not taking in. You know, the people that are doing that are angry, bitter, and have all kinds of stuff on them is why they do that, right? When they do that to you, it would be real easy to grab that spirit, and now you're bitter and angry at them. So stay innocent, from what is evil, and see what is good. God is good, right? God is innocent. He doesn't let any of this stuff change who he is ever. And he sees everything. Oh my gosh, he sees atrocities that we've probably never even imagined could be possible, right? And he still says pure, and he stays innocent. And he stay, He doesn't get bitter, he doesn't get mad, he doesn't get angry. I mean, he gets angry that that stuff's being done to people, but he would never turn anybody away if they turned. How many stories have you heard of, you know, people killing people and whatever, and, and the Apostle Paul, right? And they see the love of God on them singing, and they turn. Did God say, oh, no, I'm sorry, you did this to my... Or Paul himself, yeah, Paul himself killed all those Christians. And, you know, he's on the road to Damascus. God didn't say, well, I, you can't come to me now because you did all of this. No, because he doesn't have any of that in him. He stays innocent and he stays pure. And so then the very next line, and the God of peace will swiftly, look at this, the God of peace will swiftly pound Satan to a pulp under your feet. Okay? And the wonderful favor of our Lord Jesus will surround you. And, you know, I've heard that song for years that, you know, um, stay innocent and, or what is it? I got to be innocent of for be excellent at what is good and innocent from evil. And the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. And oh my gosh, people love that. People just love that. Oh, let's just beat him to a pulp. Let's just oh, we're gonna get out there and fight, and we're gonna people that have the spirit on them, we're gonna go against it, and we're just gonna do this, and we're gonna do that, right? And now all of a sudden, what has God just done to us? Flipped that all around. Nope, that's not how we're going to do it. The God of peace. Because you are in peace, you're not going to do anything to the devil. You're not going to squash him under your feet. You're not going to smash him like this. You're not going to fight him. You're not going to argue with him. You're not going to knock him down. You're not going to chop his head off. You're not going to do any of that. You're going to stand there in peace. I know this has happened to all of you. This has happened to me. You're mad about something? I'm a D, a D personality. Somebody pushes you, you want to push back, right? So somebody's pushed me, and I'm going to go tell all of my friends, I, I want you to push back with me. And they just sit there in peace, and they try to minister me down out of that and be calm and be in peace. Is that, is that God? Is that how God would handle this? Well, I don't know. It feels to me like that's how God would handle this. Okay. They stay in peace when you want them to get angry with you. Doesn't it just drive you crazy? Why is that? Because you're being led by an enemy and he don't like it, right? That peace throws people for a loop. And you seem like that you're just letting people walk all over you when in reality you are knocking devils. Devils are being crushed to a pulp under your feet And all you're having to do is stand there in peace. I say all you're having to do like it's easy. It's not so easy. But it is when you have the Spirit of God on you and you know. When you start knowing what that's doing to those devils around you, I think the more we learn this and the more we start walking in this and we start seeing how it crushes devils to a pulp under our feet, the more and more we're going to want to live like this. The more the enemy won't be able to touch us, okay? And the, the thing I don't like about this is he's going to keep trying harder and harder things. When I start learning how to walk at peace in this level and he can't get me here anymore, he's going to bring something. Because he's not going to just let go. You guys know that, right? He's not just going to give this territory up. He's kept some of us in chaos for a lot of years. And he's not just going to give this territory over easily. 
there'll be something else and something else and something else, and then he'll realize and he'll leave you for a more opportune time, like he did Jesus. And then he'll come back again, and he'll, you may be at peace for you know, six months or so or whatever, and he doesn't bother you, and then all of a sudden, out of the blue, here comes one of those things that you thought, and you probably have dealt with it, and it's really not you. It's him coming back trying to see, let's see if I can get them all wound up over this again. And sometimes it's been so long, we fall right back into that again, you know? But we just keep fighting this war. God says we're going to win, right? If we stay with him and we stay at this and we keep hearing him and listening to him and following what he says and doing these things, putting this armor on, like he's going to win the battle. And it's, a, it's only up to us whether we decide whether we're going to be on his side or not. Okay, I'm not going to do both of these scriptures. I had... Um, I may do this one the next time I teach. This is like one of my favorite scriptures in the whole Bible is Matthew 6, 25 through 34. And it's the whole scripture is about don't worry. Does it add one ounce of stature to your life to worry? And, um, you know, all of these things, you seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all of these things were, added, were going to be added on to you. And I thought it was so funny. You know, it, it talks about food, clothing, does it, there's three things. Was it food, clothing, and I don't think it was a house. It, huh? I don't know. Anyway, it was food, clothing, and something else. I'm not even sure it was a house. But, you know, most of our worries are so far beyond that, you know? And it's funny. I'm, I've been, like, starting to listen to and study stuff about the persecuted church and, you know, just the things that other christians and other parts of the world live through and you know nor knowing mordecai you know knowing somebody that actually lives a whole different lifestyle than we live makes you look at things a whole lot differently and you're thinking like there are people that that's the only things that they don't have enough food they don't have clothing they don't have whatever the third thing was maybe it was shelter um pay, place to lay your head um and god is telling them don't even worry about that you know and here we are, most of us, I'd say all of us in this room for sure. We, I've never went, I've went without a meal before, but that's only because I chose to. You know, I've never really been hungry for food. I've never had to go outside naked. I've always had a place to live at night, you know. So any worry that I've ever had isn't even those three things that he mentioned. And he's saying, don't even worry about those three things. He's saying, trust me, I take care of the birds, I take care of the lilies, I clothe the lilies, I do all of this. Just trust me. Come to me, do it my right way, and I will, you'll get everything that you need, and I'll take care of you. So, like, we really, right now in this country, should have nothing to worry about except those things that are trying to get into our minds. That's what we need to keep our focus on. Okay, the last one I'm going to read is Galatians 5, and I'm going to do this out of my Amplified Bible. Um, verse 22. Just kind of saying the same thing as we already said, but the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the work which He, His presence within accomplishes, I love how it says that, that's Him within us is what does this, is love. Uh, let me see, I wrote these down with some stuff beside them. I think. Yeah, maybe not. Love, joy, gladness, peace. And when in the in the Passion Bible it says peace that subdues. That word subdues means to overcome, quiet, and bring under control. Okay? So the fruit of the Spirit is peace that subdues. In other words, when we have the peace of God, it subdues those enemies. They are quieted, they come under our control, and they're overcome. So that's what that peace of the Holy Spirit does for us. Peace, joy, gladness, patience, and even temper, forbearance, kindness, goodness, benevolence, faithfulness, gentleness, meekness, humility, self-control, self-restraint, continuance, I don't know what that one is, and this is my part I love of this most, against such things there is no law that can bring a charge. So in other words, when we are living under the Holy Spirit and these are the things that we're living in, 
the enemy has nothing to bring against you. Like, if we can stay in that state of peace, there's nothing he can bring against us. We'll get to that place, like, just like Jesus will say, he comes, but he has nothing in me. Because, and bringing this into your everyday life, it is really hard right now. Because we were taught in a system that tells you to do every. it tells you that you want to have peace, but it's talking about a peace where you just, Sit in a quiet room and you're, you know, everything's going your way. Yeah, be like, oh, <laughs> everything's going your way. Nobody's against you. Your marriage is good. Your kids are good. Your money's good. Your health is good. That's the kind of peace that the world is always trying to get you to get to. You can have all of those things and still be in total turmoil on the inside and have nothing of God going on in there. And sooner or later, those things are going to fall anyway because there are other gods and there are other kingdoms. And kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall. Nothing but God stays in power forever. So, you know, when we were younger, we had certain things that ruled us. You're older, you don't care about those things anymore. They don't even, like, those things that used to rule us when we were younger, we don't, it doesn't even matter at all. And now we've got new things coming up trying to rule us, different things trying to rule us. You know, you go different places, different spirits rule in different places and different things try to rule you. But he is the king of all. He is what we're trying to get to rule our hearts. And we can get to the place where we have these fruits of the Spirit in us, and these are what we live by, then there's nothing, there's no charge. He can bring no charge against us because we're not acting out of all of those things that we used to act out. And isn't that just horrible how he does that? Like, he gives you these ideas to do these things. You were talking about condemnation and shame. He gives us these ideas to do these things that are evil and that we shouldn't do. And then he comes and he condemns us and shames us because we did them. You know, like, that's, and that's the way the world system works because it's under his control, right? So, you know, there's the scripture that talks about the things of God bring no sorrow with them. You know, everybody's trying to get salvation somewhere, some way, somehow. We're trying, always trying to get something for ourselves, right? His salvation is always going to bring sorrow. So if you try to do it his way. You don't feel loved, so you go out and you sleep with somebody because then you feel loved. Then he gives you the condemnation, the guilt, and the shame. So the sorrow comes with it. With God, you don't feel loved. You go to God. He fills you with love. You don't have to go to sleep with somebody. There's no guilt. There's no sorrow. There's no shame. You know, there's no sorrow that comes with doing it God's way. And all of these things we've talked about this morning, if we will wait on him, and remember I said waiting on him, just waiting on him is an act of war against the enemy because the enemy is... In, you know that's true because when you try to wait on him, there is a bombardment of arrows that come at you saying, oh, you can't do that, you'll die. Oh, you can't do that, your children will die. Oh, you can't do that, this will happen, that will happen. This bombardment of stuff that comes at you. And you say, nope, God, I'm waiting to hear what you have to say because you are God, you are king, you are Lord, and I'm not going to listen to that stuff, okay? And that's an act of war. And you know it is because this is the war. So... And again, we'll say, the war is not trying to get yourself in the place of peace. That is an act of war. But the, whole, the ultimate goal is to be in that place of peace where we're hearing his voice, waiting on him, doing what he's saying. And then when those arrows come, they, don't have, they have nothing against us because we haven't went off the deep end and went the way of the enemy. So this is really good revelation. It's life-changing. I don't know how much we're going to like it as we have to walk it out in our everyday life. So, God, give us grace. <laughs> okay. Anybody got anything? Y'all are so quiet after I teach. Press them. Say something. Sure. 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 <laughs> okay, that's a trick I didn't know. I'll have to do use that trick. Well, I was thinking, on. and I was like, well, I mean, you basically said it, but there's that verse that says, "Strive to enter into rest." So when we're talking about the place of when we're just ah, on the inside of ourselves before we even get to that place of peace, he says, "Strive to enter into that because he knows the fruit of what's going to happen afterwards." Right. It's right. not just to make our lives easier; he knows the end result. Yeah. Yep. Okay, anybody else? Are you sure? Are you sure you don't have anything? See? Even he's doing it. <laughs> uh, 
I like the way the NIV says this. It says, um, uh, pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. And uh, see, I think most people when they pray, you know, they're not, they're not praying fearlessly. They're praying in fear, yeah. in stress, yeah. in anger or in anger or in worry, pressure. And, um, you know, I, I just think there should be a, a fearless, that you're praying fearlessly. Yeah. You know, you can, like she said, you can be striving, and you've already, like you said, you've already said it, you can be animated but you're still in peace. Yes. You're not doing it out of fear, worry, or anxiety. You're doing that out of peace. Right. See? Yes. Adding to what you said, but I just thought this was so good. I'm so glad that you made a point about verse 18 because a lot of times people stop at take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Boom. But it says, and pray it's like that's a part of it that's a part of our warfare and yes. i just a lot of times people want yeah they you know i'm gonna put on all this armor or whatever and then nobody ever prays nobody talks to god nobody ever seeks god about it you know right. so i just i love that you made that a big point because that is a big point yes okay father we need grace to live all this out god the Father, I just pray for us as we go through our week that, God, every time we have a chance to practice this, that, God, you will bring it back to our remembrance, whether it is that we are trying to step out in something without hearing your voice or whether it's we're getting in fear because something's trying to come at us and instead we should be in peace. God, whatever it is, um, that, God, you just give us the grace to, to walk this out. You speak to us, God, that we seek you. We inquire of you, and we require you as our necessity, God. That God, just like, I just pray tomorrow morning when we wake up, when we leave here this afternoon, God, one day at a time we say, God, today I need you. Today I inquire of you of what you want from me today, and today I require you as necessity, God. Like, like the air that we breathe, God. Air that we breathe is necessity. We're not going to make it very long without air going in and out of our lungs. And God, we want you to be that kind of necessity to us, that we don't, not just that we, you know, seek you and strive to hear your voice and stuff because we don't want the bad things to happen to us or, you know, this or that, but that God, we just love you and want you and need you so much that you are necessity to us, just like air is, God. And that we don't have to think about breathing We've done it for so long, it just happens. That God, that becomes, you become, not that you become like we take you for granted, but that we need you. It becomes so normal to us for you to be our necessity. It becomes so normal to us to walk like Jesus did where he didn't do anything unless you said to do it. And he did, he did everything you said to do and he didn't do anything unless you said to. That God, you become that kind of necessity to us. That you are in everything that we do. You're in our thoughts. We don't make decisions without you. We, we take all of our attitudes to you, God. That you are everything in our day. And I just know, God, that you are so good that things work when we do it your way. That it might be harder on our flesh and it may not be as fast or as easy as if we did it a different way, but they work. And just like we said before, there's no sorrow that comes with it when we do it your way. Only the sorrow that we let happen if we try to hang on to that flesh you're trying to get rid of. So, God, we just praise you. We honor you. We glorify you. We magnify you. We prefer you. We defer to you. We esteem you. We notice you. We notice you in this place right now. We notice that you're speaking to us today. We notice that you're changing our lives. We notice that just your presence, God, of just being with you, we notice you. And we love you exceedingly, God. We just thank you for everything you're doing. Amen. <laughs>